Um, so I'm Marimeth Murray, and I'm the director of the Arctic Institute. And um, at the Arctic Institute, we're really pleased to be able to support the Northern Scientific Training Program and facilitate um, getting those awards out to students here at the University of Calgary. And it was actually me who decided that in return, the students should have to come and tell everybody about their research, which has turned out to be a really fun thing that we do every year. So I'm really happy to see you guys here today. Some people will probably come trickling in. Um, just, you know, ignore them and go on with your spiel. Um, so I'm not going to talk anymore because I'm boring. And I'm really um, pleased to introduce our first speaker today, Tessa Baker, who's going to talk to us about some of the um, work that she's been doing in the Satu settlement area of the Northwest Territories. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, as Mary Beth mentioned, my project was based in the Satu settlement area in the Northwest Territories. And sorry, and I'm um, a master's student in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and also a veterinarian. <coughs> so. so in northern Canada, um, dogs have played an important role in the lives of Indigenous people for more than 10,000 years. They've served, served on sled dog teams, they've protected people against wildlife, and they've also acted as companions. Um, and their roles have changed over this time period. Today, um, problems with dog health and welfare is, are often uh, reported in the media, and diseases um, such as uh, um, those transmitted between animals and people um, are concerns for uh, the health of community members. Um, both of these issues are um, concerns that do require uh, access to veterinary services, which is very limited in northern Canada. This access or lack of access to vet services in the north has been described for reasons such as limited availability, accessibility, and affordability. Many of these communities are geographically isolated, only accessible by winter road for a few months of the year or by air. In the Northwest Territories, the nearest vet clinic for many of these communities is in Yellowknife, down there in the south. And on this map, the red lines are those permanent roads that are available or open year-round, while the blue dotted lines are, um, uh, are the winter, sh winter roads that are short-term um, only. So you, it gives you an idea of how isolated many of these communities are. And the Satu is... So one uh, veterinary program, which is the focus of my project, um, that has actually run for 10 years is the Northern Community Health Program. And as mentioned, it's in the Sawtooth Settlement Area, and that's in the Central Northwest Territories, made up of five communities. In 2016, there are just over 2,400 people living in this uh, region, made up of five communities varying in size from 160 people to just over 800. The largest community is the community of Norman Wells, and it is both socioeconomically and demographically different from the other four communities in that their economy is largely dependent on the oil and gas industry, and they attract people from across Canada. The remaining four communities are um, predominantly Dene First Nation, um, and compared to the Northwest Territories average, which is displayed down here, they have um, lower than average, uh, or higher unemployment rates, lower than average annual incomes, and therefore a greater percentage of families living in core need. The cost of living in these communities is also very high. In 2013, it was 1.6 to 1.8 times that of living in Edmonton. And many people continue to um, practice traditional activities of hunting, trapping, and fishing, and these do supplement both their food source and their incomes. So back to the community health program. Um, this veterinary program started um, after community members raised concerns to veterinarians that were in their communities once a year doing a um, wildlife disease monitoring program. 
and the communi communities raise concerns um, about dogs becoming sick and having no means to help them, and dogs being exposed to potentially rabid wildlife and having to be shot. Um, the clinics were initiated in collaboration with the communities, and they also began with a formal needs assessment. They wanted to determine the acceptance of and needs for veterinary services in the region. The needs assessment uh, revealed a number of concerns for both animal welfare and public health. Community members uh, reported there being too many dogs in their communities. This was often regulated through dog shoot days. Uh, children commonly describe being bitten or chased by dogs. And um, interactions between dogs and wildlife occurred quite regularly with concerns for transmission of rabies, which is endemic in Arctic fox, which is that guy there. Uh, veterinarians also found that there were low rabies vaccination rates amongst dogs um, and dewormer use, and sterilization rates were also low. Um, and also less than 50, or greater than 50% of dogs that were seen in that initial uh, clinic in 2008 were considered to be in less than ideal body condition. So since that time, uh, these vet clinics have run once a year every February. And the services that are offered include um, vaccination and deworming of dogs, sterilization surgery if the owner chooses it, and education about zoonotic diseases, so those diseases that are transmissible from animals to people. And because the clinics are uh, run in the local schools, um, the uh, clinics also provide uh, classroom discussions about dog bite prevention. So anecdotally, team members have described that since the start of the program, dogs seem to be healthier with better body condition. They seem to be living longer. There are fewer, fewer free roaming dogs in the communities. And community members report there being uh, fewer dog shoot days. So the purpose of my project is to understand the impacts of these, this 10 years of uh, subsidized veterinary services on these communities from the point of view of dog health and welfare and those community concerns about dogs that were described in 2008. And this may help us uh, understand how best to provide these services in other Indigenous communities. The rationale for this project is based on physician statements um, that are described by the World Health Organization and the World Organization for Animal Health. So the WHO recommends that more than 70% uh, of dogs in a population are vaccinated for, against rabies to prevent both canine and human cases, and that 70% of dogs are sterilized to control the dog population. Um, the OIE stresses that dog, uh, that animal health and welfare are interconnected and that vet services are key to raising animal welfare standards while addressing the zoonotic disease risks. And both of the organizations highlight that to be successful, programs must include regular assessment of their progress and value. And also, as all of you know, it's very um, expensive to travel and provide services in the north and it's often logistically difficult. So it's really important that programs are provided based on evidence to ensure that they are being effective while still being resource efficient and culturally sensitive. So keeping these recommendations in mind, I'm evaluating the program with the following questions. Does once annual access to vet services improve the health and welfare of dogs and does it decrease community concerns about dogs? And I've been going, working through these questions with five phases. The first phase was obviously uh, looking for background information. So started with a literature review, um, looking at how um, uh, subsidized veterinary programs globally are evaluated. Um, and this helped provi provide the background for my project. Um, what main finding that I found was that um, subsidized vet programs are not evaluated really, not commonly, and, and definitely not commonly uh, published in peer review literature. When they were um, evaluated and published, um, the most common methods of evaluation were using questionnaires and reviewing medical records. Um, in February of this year, I participated in the 10th Annual Vet Clinics in the Sawtu Communities as a veterinarian, and I also presented my proposal to community leaders, um, looking for their input and feedback and finally their support, and all of them were supportive of me coming back this summer. 
The third phase is anal analyzing the 10 years of dog medical records, and that's still ongoing, a bit of a big project. And finally, why we're here, um, so the NSTP funded my summer field work in the Sawtu communities to accomplish a dog census and community questionnaire, and that'll be the focus of the rest of this presentation. So between June and August of this year, I went to the four smaller uh, Sawtu communities um, to complete the dog census and questionnaire. In two of the uh, communities, I was able to hire a high school student to help me out, which was really great. Um, having them with me definitely granted more trust from questionnaire respondents than when I was by myself and just some stranger on a doorstep. Um, the questionnaires were completed to help us understand um, the prevalence of dog ownership, um, types of dog husbandry practiced in the communities, um, and participants' experiences with dogs in their communities. I undertook it in a door-to-door -door format, trying to reach as many people as possible, and my sampling was entirely opportunistic in that when I knocked on a door, if someone agreed to complete the survey, then uh, they completed the survey, um, and I would always return to each house at least twice, trying to, to uh, get someone to answer the door. Uh, the dog census was completed to provide a denominator of total dogs in the community, and that helped me understand the reach of the program. Um, and I accomplished this through local knowledge of dog owners, so those high school students were really helpful. Um, also bylaw officers, wildlife officers, they were all knowledgeable about dogs because they often respond to complaints. Using visual dog counts, so often dogs are kept um, tied outside with a dog house, um, and so physically counting them and then also the completed questionnaires. I also took detailed field notes every day about my experiences in the communities and um, my interactions with community members, and I think this will help with my interpretation of results from a, a community-specific context. So I have a few results to share with you uh, from this field work. I have assigned letters to each of the communities to keep them anonymous. I would like to share the results back with the communities before making the results more public um, so that they can confirm findings or disagree. So uh, between 12 and 41% of households were surveyed depending on the community. Some people did decline to be surveyed, while others were just never home when I, when I tried. Uh, dog owners were more easily solicited to complete the questionnaire than non-dog owners, which probably isn't surprising, I suppose. Um, female community members were more likely to complete the questionnaire than male community members. Uh, respondents were most commonly between the ages of 40 and 59, and that might have just been like the time of day that I was surveying. Um, one of the open end, or the, sorry, closed-ended questions that I asked was, in the last year, have you been chased or frightened by a dog? And asking this question, I had wondered if there would be differences uh, between dog owners and non-dog owners in their response, and it seemed that non-dog owners were more likely to have had this negative experience and respond yes to this question. I asked uh, similar questions uh, in the last year, have you been knocked over by a dog or bitten by a dog? And it, it surprised me that actually only one owner in two communities um, answered yes to those questions. Uh, interestingly, despite the quite specific um, uh, wording of the question indicating in the last year, uh, many people sort of clarified their responses and said, no, never, or no, not since I was a kid. Um, in answering the question, are there unknown dogs in your community, um, 14 to 26% of uh, respondents said yes, while 40% of those who answered no um, felt that there were definitely loose dogs in their communities, but they knew whose dogs those were, um, so they were, that they were definitely owned and not stray. Other general impressions that I have from the questionnaires that I'm still working through um, were that two of four of the communities definitely felt they didn't have a problem with dogs. They felt like um, the community had a, a good grasp on, on any issues that came up, while the other two communities definitely felt that they had a problem with dogs. Um, and when they described them, they described them as, as there being too many loose dogs in the community and people just not taking care of those their dogs. And I pulled some quotes out from the questionnaires to sort of like describe or give you an idea of what people were telling me. Um, so one person said, there are too many loose dogs. People need to know that if they have a dog, then they are responsible for taking care of it. 
Um, too many dogs running around with no one watching out for them, always hungry dogs around. And another person said, the owners are not taking care of their dog, not uh, feeding them so they go around town and steal food. Um, some possible ideas about why there are these community disparities um, could be differences in community priorities, community bylaws around dogs, um, and competing com community issues. So there are lots of other social issues that um, council might be sort of more um, focused on at the time. And then also the presence or absence of um, what we would call a community champion for the program. So someone who really um, helps coordinate the program from the community, helps with scheduling, um, is kind of the contact for the program uh, when we're not around. And not every community has that person. So my dog census results. Uh, found that um, three out of four of the communities um, I was able to survey more than 50% of the owners with dogs in those communities and so that helped me get useful dog husbandry information. And it became evident that there are quite a uh, varied amount of dogs in the communities um, and that despite that three out of four of the communities still have um, more than 78% of their dogs up to date on rabies vaccines as of this summer. So when you think about the World Health Organization recommended um, amount of more than 70% of a dog population to prevent canine and human cases, that's really great. And when you think about the baseline that we started at in 2008 with 37% of dogs vaccinated for rabies, um, that's a, a big deal and a big success. So moving forward, um, I'll continue to work through my questionnaire data. I'd like to look at the overall attitude towards dogs of respondents, positive versus negative, um, and continue to work through some of the open-ended questions and look for themes using thematic analysis. And then there's the 10 years of vet dog medical records that I will continue to work through. Um, preliminary results show that um, rabies vaccination rates of dogs definitely have increased over time with less uh, or not significant differences between communities, while sterilization rates have definitely also increased, but there's significant differences between the communities in that, and also between dog sex. So females are much more likely to be spayed than dog, uh, male dogs are to be neutered. And finally, uh, February of this year when the clinics run again, I will go back up and present all my results back to the communities. And I'd like to gain their feedback and insight. So obviously I didn't reach everyone, so um, I'm hoping to stimulate discussion and uh, get their feedback and make sure that my interpretation of the findings sort of um, sit well with them. So in summary, I feel that the field work that I completed this summer helped me gain further context for the setting in which the program runs. Um, it seems generally well received, but there's definitely differences between the communities. And these differences are important to acknowledge because um, it'll help us improve the current program and it may also help um, in establishing other similar programs in other underserved communities in the north. like on this date any loose dogs will be shot and then usually what happens is everyone ties up their dogs and then it doesn't happen and then the next day they're all loose again <laughs> so yeah but that is sort of how they control population when once they start getting issues that's usually when things start happening so what about feral dogs yeah so it doesn't seem there uh, that there are unowned dogs in these communities so they're very remote and isolated so everyone seems to know whose loose dog it is that's out there. So when I sort of inquired about that, like from a stray point of view, there, there were none in these communities. So they're not on a road system like where other um, First Nations have problems with people like dropping off dogs and stuff like that. So they don't have that as an issue. The climate is also not really great. So I, I do think that, <laughs> that like any dogs that maybe are truly stray don't make it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a question? Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, if they don't truly have bylaws written into their uh, council, um, then they kind of default to the Northwest Territories Dog Act, which in that it does say you need to tie up your dog and stuff like that. Um, but it's not always enforced, and um, then some uh, councils have put in place their own bylaws as well. But yes, in theory, in every community, that would be an enforceable bylaw, but it's not always enforced. Yes? Okay. Okay, one more question. How many of these dogs are working and how many are just pets? It's a very good question. Um, there are no working sled dog teams in these four communities anymore. They used to. They all have sort of a history of having had those as working teams, um, but there are no true sled dog teams in these communities anymore. Um, but still, that doesn't mean that all of them are now pets. Some of them are, they're still kept outside the way these teams were kept, um, and they will take them out hunting with them, they'll take them out to go get firewood, um, they'll use them as, you know, alerts that there's wildlife in the area, things like that. So I guess they're working, but in a different way. Yeah. There's going to be uh, opportunities at the end of this presentation today. Can you people to come ba back uh, to the um, to the institute yeah But you need, I'm just trying to turn on the, it should be, where is it? Where's that screen? Oh, well, there it is. I hate it. Okay. Right. Thanks, Pat. Okay, so our next speaker is Samantha Jones from the Geography Department, and she's going to talk to us today about uh, carbon cycling uh, in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about uh, Arctic carbon cycling, specifically building a dissolved inorganic carbon budget in Cambridge Bay. So Samantha, can you make sure that you're not looking so much at the images but you're speaking into the microphone? Yes, I can do that. Right. Am I blocking the screen by standing in front of this? Okay, so this image shows a picture of the global carbon cycle. And what you can see here is reservoirs of carbon indicated by uh, the boxes. And those are showing carbon reserves or carbon stocks. And you have those in the terrestrial environment, the marine environment, and also in the atmosphere. Um, you also have uh, fluxes indicated. And so where a flux in this case is a transfer of carbon from one reservoir to another. So you can see those represented with arrows. Um, and the black text in the black arrows is representing fluxes or movement of carbon from these different reservoirs uh, pre-industrial, so before 1750. And then the red arrows and the red text are illustrating the changes related to human influence, so anthropogenic uh, carbon changes in the reservoirs and also anthropogenic carbon fluxes. So um, burning of fossil fuels would be an example of that. I'm going to focus on the marine part of the carbon cycle and specifically talk about the dis dissolved inorganic carbon. So this series of equations uh, talks about the dissolved inorganic carbon cycle. And what I'm really talking about here is carbon dioxide. So in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide exists as a gas. Um, and then when it becomes dissolved in water, it separates and produces several different species. And so when we refer to dissolved inorganic carbon, we're talking about the sum of all of these species. So this ser series of equations illustrates how that works. Um, you have carbon dioxide in the gas form, which is then dissolved in water and becomes carbon dioxide dioxide in the aqueous form, and that's what's shown in the first equation. Then that dissolved carbon dioxide reacts with the water molecule and produces carbonic acid, and that's shown in the first half of the second equation there. But we're not done there. The carbonic acid then separates. It undergoes what's called a dissociation reaction and produces a hydrogen ion, the positively charged part of that molecule, and then the bicarbonate anion, which is the other half. 
the bicarbonate then uh, further disassociates, so this guy, into another hydrogen ion and the carbonate anion. And so the relative proportions of all of these different species are dependent on the properties of the water column that you're looking at, but all of them together make up dissolved inorganic carbon. And you can see that in the last equation. So when we say dissolved in inorganic carbon throughout the presentation, I'm referring to the total of the dissolved carbon dioxide and then the acid in those ions as well. The overarching objective of my project is to build a dissolved inorganic carbon budget for the Cambridge Bay area. And here's Cambridge Bay, if you're not familiar. So the map here on the right shows the location with a yellow star. It's on Victoria Island in Nunavut. And if you zoom in, you can see what the bay looks like. So we have the bay proper, um, and then it opens up into the D Strait which then connects to the Arctic Ocean through the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. And on the west side of the bay, we have what's known as West Arm. And then on the east side of the bay, over here, you have the discharge of Freshwater Creek into Cambridge Bay. And that's just to the east of the town site of Cambridge Bay, which is located there. So why work in Cambridge Bay? Well, there's a few reasons, and one of the big ones is the knowledge gap. So there's an absence of direct measurements in these high latitude systems. We definitely do have a good suite of studies, but most of the global understanding of carbon cycling and the carbon models are biased to low latitude data. And so when you look at the work that's been done in the literature, um, you can see right away that some of those high latitude real data points that we need to ground truth the models and to improve their predictive capability are lesser numbers than their counterparts in the lower latitudes. And so um, if you think about Arctic field work, it's challenging, it's expensive. Uh, and so being able to collect information in those unique and challenging environments is really going to help improve uh, those global studies. In terms of the carbon model for Cambridge Bay, it will have impacts in several different arenas. The first one being that it will act as a baseline. So in order to understand what's going to happen going forward, we need to know what's happening right now. So if we can develop a baseline carbon budget, we can then consider what's happening with climate change and through future development and look at what that means, how it's impacting the carbon cycle in that area. As I mentioned previously, Arctic fieldwork is challenging and expensive, and so it's not always feasible to go and do fieldwork in every area that you're interested in. But you might need to try to understand a system there, make a prediction. So building a budget in an area like Cambridge Bay then can potentially be used as an analog in other areas where it's not feasible to go into the field. It will act as a framework to contextualize other processes that are occurring. So when we want to start looking at what's happening in the physical or biological environment, we have a big picture uh, carbon cycle to reference to. And then global integration. So as I mentioned, um, we have less real data or direct measurement in those polar environments. And so by collecting information in Cambridge Bay, even though it's a local budget, other people will be able to use that uh, in understanding global models and their predictions for high latitude areas. And finally, Cambridge Bay has become a research hub. Uh, the new Canadian High Arctic Research Station is located in Cambridge Bay. The Arctic Research Foundation operates its research vessel, the Martin Bergman, out of Cambridge Bay. And we are able to use some lab space at the Nunavut Arctic College. So we have a good uh, host of resources in that community to help with our research. To get started, we can look to the literature and look at samples of dissolved inorganic carbon budgets to help us frame up what we might like to do. This example is for a fjord in Denmark, and they've divided the water column into two layers. Um, and so what this means is they're looking at some surface water and deeper water where they're saying the properties of that water column are different in those two layers. They've indicated uh, the imports and the exports of carbon into the system, and you can see that marked with the different arrows. So you have dissolved inorganic carbon coming in from a river, you also have air-sea gas exchange with the atmosphere, and then you have export out into the Baltic Sea. 
In the center, in the two different layers, they've labeled NEP, which stands for Net Ecosystem Production. And this is really referring to the balance between uh, photosynthesis and respiration. So depending on what biology is living in those layers, you either have a primary production where you're photosynthesizing and you're removing carbon dioxide from the water column, or you have respiration where you're releasing carbon dioxide into the water column. And depending on the balance of those processes, you're impacting uh, the carbon cycle. So if we want to start to build a carbon budget for Cambridge Bay, we need to think about what I call the three Cs. We need to think about the container, so what Cambridge Bay looks like, what's the geography, what's the physical oceanography. We need to think about what's in the container, so the contents. Is it open water season? Um, or do you have uh, ice in the winter? Or do you have a combination of the two in either uh, break up or freeze up in the transitional seasons in spring and fall? And then what are your contributions? So what are your import and export of carbon? And in Cambridge Bay, we have import from the river, meltwater, perhaps from the Arctic Ocean. We've got air-sea gas exchange. We have the creatures that are living in the water column. And so we need to think about all of those things in order to start to draw up a budget for Cambridge Bay. So we can sketch out what this would look like for Cambridge Bay through the different seasons. Uh, and I'm going to start up here in summer, which is the open water season. And this looks similar to the one I showed two slides ago from the literature. So we have a two-layer water column, um, and I've indicated the imports and the exports. So we've got a river flowing in, that freshwater creek on the east side of the town. We have perhaps lateral input from the ocean and lateral output export to the Arctic Ocean. We have exchange with the atmosphere. And then, of course, we have the biological community that's living in the water column and impacting the carbon dioxide there. As we move into the autumn and we start to freeze up, sea ice starts to form on the surface of the water and that begins to inhibit the air-sea gas exchange. And so you start to see some changes in what your budget might look like. By the time we've got into the winter, we're fully ice covered in Cambridge Bay. And so that layer of sea ice does inhibit the air-sea gas exchange. Um, and of course, the river is no longer flowing. It's frozen, completely frozen in the winter. And then we move back up into the spring, um, where we restore the flow of the river with meltwater and also uh, with the local watershed. And we start to break up that ice and you resume your uninhibited air-sea gas exchange. So we can look at all of these different uh, parameters and this will really help us guide our data collection. We can start to look at what's interesting, what do we need to understand to build the budget, and then we can focus our field campaigns on collecting information on those properties. And for the rest of the presentation, I'm just going to focus on one aspect of this. I'm going to talk about the river specifically. So this is the Freshwater Creek and Grainer Lake watershed. Um, the river is located here at the Star, and so that is crude location of the discharge point from the river into Cambridge Bay, so the east of the town site. It drains a large lake here, Grainer Lake, but it also drains a large uh, permafrost and thaw lake landscape. The red outline is the the outline of the entire watershed. And so all of the meltwater and everything in that perimeter is draining out through Cambridge Bay and into the Arctic Ocean um, via Freshwater Creek. At that star site, we collect weekly to biweekly data from Freshwater Creek. And we focus on two main things. We run what is called a CTD, so that's conductivity temperature depth. And for the river, um, we're effectively using that for two things. We're collecting information on the water temperature and on salinity. The CTD, uh, you'll see more later in my presentation and also in Patrick's, it's typically used in the water column and it's an instrument outfitted with lots of different sensors that tell you things about the parameters of the water column. But here we're really focused on those two items. We're also collecting water samples for the dissolved inorganic carbon and a suite of other parameters, some of which we'll analyze in our labs and others are going to some of our collaborators so we can work on complementary aspects of the carbon cycle. This is an image of what the water sampling site looks like, um, so fairly remote. Uh, and you can see in the foreground here, a little building, and this is actually an Environment Canada gauging station. 
And so we get a discharge rate, river flow, which tells us the volume of water moving past this location. And they actually do it real time. So if you go on online, you can get every five minutes. And then they take that information and they process it and give us daily averages, monthly and annual averages. And we can use that information in combination with the concentrations of inorganic carbon that we measure in our water samples to calculate the total load of carbon, inorganic carbon delivered into Cambridge Bay via the river. And so this image shows the real-time discharge or flow rate for the Freshwater Creek over the 2017 season. Now this is preliminary data from the Environment Canada website, so they will take this and QC it and release their official annual summary. But you can see uh, on this graph that breakup and flow of the river occurs in the uh, beginning of June, and then that peaks with all the meltwater flow and then tapers off towards freeze up, which happens sometime at the end of October. We don't just collect data at that one spot on the river, we also collect CTD data and water samples at a series of transects in and around Cambridge Bay. And I want to focus on what we call the creek line, which is shown in this red dashed outline. And you can see a series of orange points. The river is located up here, and then we have a transect that goes out into the bay. And we collect um, CTD data so that water column properties along that line, as well as select water samples. And we can collect um, the water samples in the shallower water, sometimes from the shore, um, by small boat, or we drill through ice and do that. Um, and when you get out into the bay proper, you're either going in a small boat or aboard the Martin Bergman, depending on the time of year. This is a sample of what that data looks like. Um, so we collect data along that transect about every week to two weeks, and we've done that over the period of the summer, so we can get what we call a time series. So we have the, the same data collection weekly, so we can look at how things are changing and evolving uh, over the spring and summer season. And these graphs are showing the same cross-section over three different weeks. You're looking from A to A prime, which is marked on this map here. So Freshwater Creek is discharging in this direction. Uh, Cambridge Bay Town site is located right here. So you can see that cross-section. And so that's represented on each of these panels. And the color that you're looking at represents chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is one of the properties that's measured on the, one of the sensors on the CTD. And that's telling us something about primary production. So remember we talked about ecosystem production earlier on and that that impacts the water column because those primary producers remove carbon dioxide from the water column and incorporate that into their structure. So this is an important property that we can use to learn something about what's going on in terms of the biological community. And that does direct impact on the carbon cycle because they're interacting with the inorganic carbon in the water. So you can see here um, that you get a low concentration of chlorophyll in the shallow water um, towards the beginning of breakup. So that first panel's from June 5th and 6th. And then as you move into uh, the later in June and further into the summer, the ice breaks up, the water becomes ice free, sunlight can penetrate deeper in the water column, these guys start to create a bloom, they start extracting the nutrients out of the water column, and they move down to deeper depths where there's more nutrients but they can still access uh, the sunlight. And you can see that develop over this time series. So this is the type of data that we collected this year and while I was up in the field supported by NSTP. And this is the sort of thing that we'll be um, sifting through over the next few months and at analyzing um, to help us plan our future field work in the areas we'd like to focus on. So what's next for me? Um, well, this summer was my first field, st field season. I started my PhD in January, so I went up and collected some uh, preliminary information. And so I've got all of that information. I'm in the process of going through it, uh, processing it, and starting my interpretation. We have all of our water samples um, from the Freshwater Creek, but I also have other areas in Cambridge Bay that I'm looking at as well. So I'll be working on analyzing those properties in the lab. And then the interpretation from those two data sets will help guide my field planning for the next campaign, which I'm hoping to do uh, probably early melt season next year, so maybe May to June. Thanks, so I can take questions. There is. <laughs> I didn't put it in here. Um, 
there is a sewer out, outflow, and it is located, let me see, I can't really see from here. It's located right around here. Um, and we actually collected data uh, on purpose to look at the sewage outflow and how that will impact because we, uh, our hypothesis is that we potentially maybe have some uh, biological activity related to when outflow is coming. So we collected uh, data before, during, and after sewage release to try to look and see um, what's going on in that area and see if it has any impact. It is a small town and it's a small facility, so it might not have any impact, but because the bay itself is kind of constrained area, we're interested to investigate that more. So we actually did take that into account and we sampled accordingly for that. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question and um, I'm just wondering where you're doing the analysis, the water analysis, the sample analysis, here or at Char? Here. Um, so we have, we brought back water samples with us and we have a lab in the geography department and then some of the complementary data um, that we collected, like we collected methane samples as well and they're analyzed at UBC. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. So, um, Samantha. So our next speaker will be Patrick Duke, also from geography. A lot of geographers here today, a lot of geographers getting NSTP money, yay. That's good. Um, and Patrick will talk about the um, work that he's been doing on autonomous sensor platforms and I'll let him talk about it in that part. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, so my name is Patrick Duke. I'm a master's student with Dr. Brent Ellis, and I'm in the same lab as Sam. My project is estimating the annual cycle of PCO2 in near shore Arctic surface water using an innovative autonomous, autonomous sensor platform. Bit of a mouthful. So I just want to start with some context and some background on why we're looking at this. So this should be a familiar graph for most. This is the Neelan curve out of the Mauna Loa Observatory. So here we have the concentration of atmospheric CO2 over time. As you can see, that atmospheric concentration of carbon fluctuates year to year. That fluctuation actually isn't interannual variability in anthropogenic emissions, but actually the exchange of carbon between Earth's natural reservoirs. Those are reservoirs include uh, the atmosphere, the global ocean, and the terrestrial biosphere that Sam touched on in that first slide. So it's important to understand what's happening in the ocean because it's the second largest reservoir of carbon globally. Here we have uh, three modeled scenarios that look at oceanographic uh, uptake of CO2 at various latitudes along the y-axis. As you can see, um, we have a much firmer other understanding at the uh, equatorial regions compared to the polar regions as those sites are sampled much more frequently. Those bars are actually the tested scenarios that these models are put through. So in the Arctic, specifically in polar regions and the Arctic, those, the uh, modeled scenarios don't quite hold up and we have a lot of error in computing the uptake of carbon. Those models are built on the annual understanding of the carbon cycle and without the monitoring necessary to add to that, to that knowledge gap, we're, we're really missing out with these models. So far in the Arctic, the dominant um, observation method has been through opportunistic icebreaker surveys, and most of these icebreaker surveys occur during the open water season, which happens to be during the summer months. This, these are very important studies, but they leave quite the gap with offering only temporally limited data sets. There is, however, a complete annual data set that is uh, published by ELS 2012 and Chadwick 2011 on board um, the Amundsen uh, crews that took place in 2007, 2008 in Amundsen Gulf. You can see here, um, time is along the x-axis with the sea surface temperature being the small gray dots, and then the open uh, larger circles being partial pressure of CO2 or pCO2. And then the gray dotted line is the atmospheric reference for uh, carbon dioxide concentration. And then the top line is the dotted uh, gray line is sea surface or sea ice concentration. Interesting to note here that during the fall, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the in the ocean is actually undersaturated with respect to that atmospheric reference, 
And then through the highlighted box, that's during the winter months when sea surface, when sea ice concentration is 100%, it actually remains undersaturated with respect to atmospheric CO2 conditions. And then we return to undersaturation through the, through the summer months. The site actually acts as a net sink for atmospheric carbon throughout the year. But this isn't the only annual, complete annual data set offered in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, in 2015, Ocean Networks Canada, along with Dalhousie University and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, deployed a pro-oceanist PCO2 sensor on board the Cambridge Bay Community Undersea Observatory. So Sam mentioned Cambridge Bay. It's on the southern tip of Victoria Island and on the north side of D Strait. Uh, here's a photo of Cambridge Bay looking north. Uh, Suzanne, you get to see this. Uh, just to the left of the photo near the yellow star is actually where the platform is deployed. And you can see in the image on the right, the platform's sitting on the seafloor at about seven meters depth. When I uh, first started my master's, actually the first year of pro-oceanist data had been completed. And you can see some interesting trends here. Um, there's undersaturation through the, through the fall, followed by supersaturation into the winter months with respect to atmospheric reference, which is that, that line straight across at 400 parts per million. And then in mid-February, you can see a, a drawdown in PCO2, followed by a second peak, and then a steady decline uh, through the spring into the open water season, where through most of the summer months, we can see undersaturation again. This, after looking at this data set, this brought up the question, how can we utilize innovative sensor technology to describe the carbon system at our study site? How reliable are these sensors? What is the stability of the sensor after a full year deployment? Can we use the sensor to interpret uh, different uh, processes that are actually affecting PCO2 at our study site? So to answer these questions, I'll be focusing on the platform, of course, and specifically the pro-oceanist sensor. So the pro-oceanist sensor is a unique sensor in that it measures the partial pressure of CO2 using non-disruptive uh, infrared de detection. And in order to have that stability for year-long deployment, it makes use of a CO2 scrubber in which it pushes internal gas through the system and a CO2 um, removal through a uh, soda line to give an automatic zero measurement so that it can maintain stability through its deployment interval. But in order to properly evaluate the usability of the sensor, we had to take field-based measurements and observations looking at the carbon system. So this started in January and then continued through the spring and uh, melt season thanks to NSTP and the Arctic Institute. <laughs> I see Brent shaking his head at that last photo. It was a little bit sketchy, but that's okay. Uh, and then it continued into the summer months and the open water season and has continued into the fall as the ice starts to freeze up again. So we have over 23 validation samples taken from January through August, which we hope to use to validate the use of the sensor and to pin the sensor data in order to properly describe the carbon system at our study site. But looking at that first, uh, first kind of raw data set, you can see it differs significantly from the, that first year of data that I showed you. So this is the most recent year. So this is 2016-2017 deployment, and you can see the largest change here is the magnitude of PCO2. The range isn't quite as great as that first year. One of the possibilities, so this is that first year data set just to, just to compare again. So you can see the range is actually much higher, especially during the winter months, we reach a much greater supersaturation of, of PCO2 in the water column. One of the possibilities here could be sea ice thickness. So here's a plot of uh, ice thickness, and this is during the 2015-2016 data set. You can see formation starts in about October, and then it reaches a maximum thickness of about 1.8 meters uh, right around the end of May, early June. During that second year, we can see when there's a much greater, well, few, less magnitude of PCO2 values, especially during the winter, during that second year, the ice thickness doesn't grow quite as, quite as thick as that first year. So freeze up starts a little bit later, and then the thickness only reaches about 1.5 meters. One of the possibilities here could be that um, as Cambridge Bay had kind of a, 
uh, a large snowfall this year compared to previous years, that increased snowfall on the sea ice provides increased insulation, which can actually um, reduces sea ice growth. So with reduced sea ice growth, you're having less brine rejection, saline brine rejection into the water column. And with reduced saline brine reduction, you are um, not contributing as much salinity to the water column. And increased salinity can lead to decreased solubility of, of carbon dioxide in seawater, which would increase the partial pressure of CO2. So reduced brine rejection by less sea ice growth could actually reduce the, the value of CO2 that we have in the water column. So not reaching quite high values of supersaturation super during the winter months. So here we can see um, ice thickness with respect to PCO2 during, that, during this, this most recent year. And you can see undersaturation through most of the fall, followed by supersaturation in the winter months, and then undersaturation again um, before the ice comes off. So this area presumably isn't acting as a sink for or is always acting as a sink for CO2 while air-sea gas exchange is unobstructed by sea ice. It's interesting to note, uh, especially during the winter months, the strong correlation with oxygen. So here is a plot of PCO2 and oxygen concentration. You can see that what Sam touched on with net ecosystem production is the balance of photosynthesis and respiration. So here you can see, especially from January to March, uh, respiration is dominating, where we're seeing a consumption of oxygen and a production of carbon dioxide. And then from March through June, you can see that net, uh, net ecosystem production is dominated by photosynthesis, where we're seeing a production of oxygen and a using of carbon dioxide. The question is, what's driving this relationship during the winter months? So here we have chlorophyll uh, plotted against PCO2. You can see that chlorophyll values, which Sam kind of touched on, is a measurement of, from our sensor uh, on the platform, is a measurement of water column um, phytoplankton or algae. And here you can see during April, that's when that relationship really starts to pick up. But what's contributing to the earlier drawdown in March? Here we have photosynthetically active radiation, kind of adding another piece to the puzzle. You can see that uh, December to January is the polar night. We're having no photosynthetically active radiation being recorded at our study site at seven meters depth. But then right when the sun kind of starts to peak over the horizon in February, we have an increase in photosynthetically active radiation. But this doesn't line up quite well with the chlorophyll concentration that I showed you previously. So we have available photosynthetically active radiation, but the chlorophyll values aren't showing up. So which primary producers are contributing to that March drawdown? This is a question that we raised, and right now, looking at the data, it seems to be either ice algae on the bottom of sea ice or benthic uh, production on the seafloor. So this kind of leaves me with how do we quantitatively describe the processes that are actually influencing PCO2 through the complete annual cycle. So Sam talked about the, um, the ocean box model and differentiating processes. But here, I just want to scale and apply that box model to my study site, and specifically the platform. In order to do that, to scale and apply a diagnostic box model, um, we had to add a, uh, a few terms, so, which include sea ice, and as well as change the way that variables can be derived based on the available data, so of all those sensors on the platform. We hope to use this box model to uh, describe the processes that are affecting PCO2 on a seasonal uh, time scale at our study site. So we have the term on the left, which is the change in PCO2 over time, and then we can use the uh, our um, secondary supplementary sampling as well as the other platform, the other sensors on the platform to derive the variables on the right. The question is, if we use this model, when can we make the right side uh, equal to the, to, the, to the left side, and when does the model work well? So during certain times of the year, maybe the derived variables that we produce for the right side of the equation don't line up quite as well with the change in PCO2 that we're observing with the ProOceanus sensor. 
So kind of a what's next for me, I, I hope to run the validation samples that we collected from January through the end of August in order to validate and compare to the ProOceanist PCO2 data as well as derive box model variables throughout the year based on the sensors available on the platform and the supplementary data that we've collected. And then we hope to temporally evaluate the model's performance during that time. So when can we use this, the variables that we derived to actually get the PCO2 change that we recorded through specific time intervals. And that will hopefully help us determine the usability of the ProOceanist sensor to describe the carbon system at our study site. Thanks so much. So that's on board the platform. Uh, there's, an, there's a sensor that's recording ice, ice thickness, yeah. So, okay, so for the first one, so this, our site is on a shelf sea in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, but as far as Arctic Ocean, um, I think there's two scenarios that are possible, if you've read up on this a little bit, but it could either be that with a, a very uh, thin mixed layer depth, like it's not very, a very shallow mixed layer depth, that can become super saturated with PCO2 rather quickly, that there's not gonna be a lot of uptake if that makes sense. And then as far as uh, acidification, actually I think there's, so with PCO2 uh, increased dissolved, I anticipated a <laughs> acidification question, but with when you're increasing carbon dioxide in the Arctic Ocean, you have a decrease in pH, which is increasing acidification. And actually one of the quick stats that I wanted to throw out there was uh, from a study from February 2009, with atmospheric CO2 increasing to 552 parts per million, um, 50% of the Arctic Ocean surface is projected to begin undersaturated with spectroregonite. So that has a huge impact with acidification. So 50% by uh, 2054 under the business as usual IPCC projections. Yeah. Any other questions? So you want me? Am I correct? Yeah. Whoa. So our next speaker today is Colin Paget from Geoscience, and he's going to talk to us about some work he's been doing in Southwest <laughs> Yukon. Can I plug that in? Or is that uh, like through? I guess so. Do you need more than? No, oh, it's your. Oh, I've yeah, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that'll work. It's okay, I'll use the mouse. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no big deal. Might have to plug it into the screen to see. Oh, I see. Like, there's a thing on the side here. Oh. That's all right. Okay. The mouse works for everybody else. Right. Um, right, yeah, so I'm here today to talk about uh, some research that I'm doing as one portion of my graduate program here at yeah. University of Calgary in, uh, in geoscience. Um, so I'm kind of changing gears, I think, from some of the other talks and, and looking at some rocks in southeastern Yukon. Uh, and these are upper mantle and lower crustal xenoliths uh, from the upper Highland River region of southeastern Yukon. Uh, the photo I have on the screen there shows um, what the typical area looks like. Um, this is actually looking across the Highland River Valley um, into the, the area where most of these xenolith rocks, uh, xenoliths are hosted. Um, so I guess to, to start out, the first question really is what is a xenolith? And, and to follow up, why do, why do we really care about them? Why do we want to study them? Uh, so the first bit is that a xenolith is, is a fragment or a rock fragment that's been broken off um, and then is surrounded or entrained in uh, an intruding magma. Um, in the study area, we're dealing with dikes that have basically come up from, from great depths, uh, relatively great depths, and they've, they've entrained these uh, upper mantle and lower crustal rocks. Um, and then 
because we see we have these rocks that are uh, from these deep depths uh, that we're able to then sample on surface, these rocks are very rare, typically on surface. We don't have exposures of them elsewhere or typically elsewhere. And so they are extremely important for our understanding of the structure, the composition, uh, or the thermal state uh, of these deep-seated regions of Earth's interior. Um, so where, do, where else do we find these rocks, and why are these particular ones uh, so important? Um, what I have here is our terrain maps. Uh, I think everyone can still hear me. Our terrain maps of uh, the northern Cordillera here on the left, showing Alaska, Yukon Territory, and uh, British Columbia, and then a blow up of Yukon Territory over here on the right. Uh, what we see is the black triangles represent uh, currently known major xenolith localities in the Cordillera. And what, what's evident here is that all of these locations uh, sit fairly outboard of uh, this boundary between uh, accreted terrains uh, in the Cordillera. And so this sample site being so far inboard and so close to that ancestral margin of, of North America, uh, it gives us some, uh, some information on this part of the Cordillera uh, relative to all of these more outboard positions. And so that's why these st studies in particular are, are of interest. The, this slide here is just, again, a kind of a blow-up of the actual field area. And moving away from a terrain map and into an actual bedrock geology map, uh, what this shows is the geology of the region at a 1 to 50,000 scale. Um, we see the three locations that we have, um, that we've mapped out of these, these dikes that host these various xenoliths. Um, what they are are sedimentary rocks, so carbonate and siliciclastic strata uh, that are around 500 million or Cambrian to Ordovician in age. Um, and they make up, uh, or they're found within rocks of the Selwyn fold and thrust belt. So these rocks have been variably deformed and metamorphosed. So what, what do they look like in the field? Um, fortunately, they're really easy to, to pick up uh, when you're walking a ridge line or whether you're flying over them. Uh, it's pretty easy to spot these, these dikes within the country rock. Um, but notably about them is that they, uh, they do form these uh, kind of three to five meter dikes and they are uh, also exhibit this uh, excellent columnar jointing about their margins, uh, which is very, very distinct in the field. Most of the rocks are, almost all the rocks are sedimentary, and so features like this stand out quite well. Um, as well, um, they're, these are host rocks to xenoliths, so the xenoliths themselves tell us that there's, there's something else. And so this is a photo here just showing us uh, an example of the xenoliths. Uh, these here are mantle type xenoliths. So you can see they're a little bit green. Um, these are typically made up of pyroxenes and, and olivines, and I'll get into some images of those. So moving on from this part of the talk, I wanna, I'm going to break things up into looking at first the mantle rocks uh, that we found and trained in these dikes, and then look at the crustal rocks after that. Um, and kind of go through the story of how we go about calculating pressure and temperature conditions for these various rocks to try and ascertain what exactly is going on um, at, in these deep-seated areas or these deep regions of, the, of Earth's interior um, at, uh, at the time that these, these rocks were intruded. <coughs> so the, this first slide, slide shows uh, two uh, thin section photographs or scans. Uh, the one on the right uh, I'll start with um, shows the, the host rocks that we just saw pictures of uh, and then these uh, mantle xenoliths uh, and then the contact between them is, is quite sharp and that's important because we don't uh, the chemistry can be affected in the host rock if we have any sort of partial melting of these, uh, these xenolith rocks, and, and vice versa is true as well. We can have effects, chemical effects of the, the host rock uh, infiltrating and affecting the, uh, the xenoliths. Um, over here shows kind of a typical texture uh, and mineralogy of these, these rocks. Uh, so we have orthopyroxene, um, olivine, um, and then finer grain clinopyroxene and some recrystallized olivine uh, make up the bulk of these rocks. But as well, they also contain um, these small brown spinels, uh, which typically have this kind of vermicular or sometimes referred to as holly leaf texture. Actually, naming these rocks uh, involves doing some modal analysis. And so, what we do is we use a combination of backscattered electron imaging um, and grayscale thresholding um, with an image processing program called ImageJ. Um, and this allows us to, to uh, very accurately. Uh, discern the proportions of olivine, orthopyroxene, and clinopyroxene. And so I've done this for a number of samples so far and uh, found very good agreement. All of the, the samples have plotted within this position in the Lahertz-like field. 
Um, so these rocks um, going beyond the mantle and pyrotite uh, naming would be Spinel Hertzlitz. So the next step in this path to finding out what the pressure and temperature conditions are for these rocks is um, looking at them for uh, equilibrium textures, uh, making sure that the phases that we see in these rocks um, are existing in equilibrium so that we can then apply various tools uh, to calculate the pressure and temperature conditions. And so the things that we look for in, in these slides to ascertain that are things like triple junctions. So over here with the black arrows, we see these 120 degree interfacial angles uh, that show textural or indicate potential textural equilibrium. Uh, on top of that, uh, we also see that there's very little or, or no chemical zonation within, uh, within these minerals. Um, and these things kind of help to tell us that they, they're all right and they're acceptable for uh, assessing pressure and temperature. Uh, so the, the next, after that, what we do is we use the electron microprobe in the geoscience department to complete mineral analyses on all of the phases. And then we take that information, uh, particularly looking at orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene pairs, and we calculate temperatures from that. Um, so the temperatures that were calculated for the rocks that I've looked at so far um, range between 930 to 1100 degrees Celsius for their uh, equilibrium. So that's essentially the temperature that they would have been at when they were sampled uh, as these dikes came up and collected these rocks uh, during their ascent. Um, but that's only really half of the story. Um, the big piece that we want to know is what are the pressures of these rocks? Pressure corresponds fairly directly to depth, and it's that depth down below surface that we're really concerned with. And so we use that as kind of the first step uh, towards figuring that out. And so the next thing we do is uh, take a bulk composition of the rock and we calculate um, these phase equilibria diagrams uh, which basically show just, uh, pressure and depth on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis and what they show are regions within like so these regions here show the stable mineral assemblages at those various pressures and, and uh, temperatures and so the rocks that we have all fall within this olivine orthopyroxene spinel uh, zone here. And so when we add in the temperature information that we've already gotten, uh, we find that this region here is where we would expect to find um, these, uh, these rocks to have equilibrated. Um, one kind of takeaway, I guess, is that what this means is that we can put a, give an estimate for the maximum depth at which these, uh, these rocks would have been entrained in that, uh, that upwelling uh, dike. So then moving on to the, the crustal xenoliths, uh, which are quite different. Um, these rocks are, uh, contain uh, garnet here um, and orthopyroxene. And then they're, they're comprised, all of these, the, the white or the clear minerals, um, are a combination of alkali feldspars, plagioclase feldspars, and quartz. So in the first, with the, the mafic or the, the mantle rocks, we were able to use grayscale thresholding and backscatter electron imaging to be able to work out what the, uh, the modal analysis is for these rocks. But for these, it's not quite so easy to do that because in the microscope, uh, when you're taking an image of everything that's white, it's very hard to tell the difference between one white mineral versus the next. And so what we wind up having to do is use, uh, again, more backscatter electron imaging and then some electron dispersive spectrometry uh, to generate these, um, these false color maps of the various mineral phases in these sections. And then from these false color maps, we can um, ascertain extremely accurate uh, modal analysis for the various phases. Um, this then is combined, this modal analysis is combined with the mineral analyses that we do. And from that, we can collect or we gain uh, that bulk rock kind of whole rock information that we need to proceed with modeling. So for these crustal rocks, um, there are a couple of different uh, things that we can do first, and one is conventional thermometry, um, where we were able to use iron and magnesium exchange between garnet and orthopyroxene to calculate temperatures. And for these uh, rocks, we obtain temperatures of around 950 degrees Celsius. Um, afterwards, because we actually have a mineral assemblage that supports it, we're able to calculate also the pressure by conventional thermobarometric means, and so we found that using this uh, barometer, we had rock, these rocks were situated around 11 and a half kilobars. So 
the modeling that follows actually winds up kind of supporting and, and kind of checking this information. Uh, and so that's what we did is again, with that calculated bulk composition, um, we developed a, a model uh, of the uh, an equilibrium phase diagram again of these rocks and, and where these different equilibrium assemblages would plot. And so the, with the, based on the assemblages that we have, we should plot within this field here. And this box here shows with the errors um, where uh, these thermometers and barometers uh, would sit. And what we see is we actually have agreement between the uh, thermal barometric information here and the, the phase diagram modeling. Uh, and so I guess just to kind of conclude, the biggest thing that, uh, that we've gotten from this is that uh, some of the minimum estimated temperatures for the mantle xenoliths are quite close to the, those of the lower crustal xenoliths. Um, we have, there's a, a, sub, a divide between the, uh, the, up, the mantle and the crust, and that's called the MOHO, or the Mohorovicic discontinuity. And so the crustal rocks have to sit above that and the mantle rocks below that. And because we have temperatures and pressures, or I guess pressures for the crustal rocks that suggest that they would fall around 39 kilometers of depth, um, this is actually quite a bit, or a little bit uh, lower down in the crust than those previously known uh, for an area just outboard of this region, uh, which sit around 33. So there's a potential for that to be a, a significant um, piece of understanding what the structure is of the Earth um, in this particular region. Um, very recently, and just as kind of an, an additional note, is that we have, we've gotten some ages back for these dikes, and, and these ages fall right around 45 million years. And so what that means is that all this information that we're finding out, all these pressure and temperature conditions, uh, what the structure of that uh, mantle versus crust divide looks like, um, these are all going to be kind of a snapshot in time around that 45 million year uh, picture. And so um, that's, that's a big, I guess that's the takeaway here, uh, what we were after. Uh, so going forward, uh, there's a lot more samples to analyze and to really confirm this information, but also I want to go ahead and do, and do some geochronology of the, uh, within the crustal rocks themselves to see how old those rocks actually are. So not just the ages of the dikes, but ages of these rocks that have been sampled. Um, are they extremely old Archean rocks that are part of North American Craton, or are these younger rocks uh, deposited at a later or an earlier time, uh, more recently? Anyway, thank you. They're very localized, yeah. yeah. There's no um, mafic uh, intrusive rocks or volcanism uh, within probably about 150 kilometers of the region. Yeah. So, you want to give so scenario now? So our next speaker today is Samara Samimi from Geography, and she's going to talk about meltwater retention processes um, in the Greenland ice sheet. So hello, uh, my name is Samara Samimi. I'm a PhD student here in the Department of Geography, and my research is in meltwater retention processes in Greenland. I'm going to start with some introduction, then I will explain more about my research, and then you can ask me lots of questions. How does it? Oh. Okay. So we have uh, two ice sheets in our planet. Okay, Greenland in the north and Antarctica in the south, and they play an important role in our global climate. Not only for their very high albedo, albedo means reflectivity, whiteness is a big piece of white, uh, and they reflect sunlight and keep our planet cool. So not only for its albedo, but also for the amount of uh, liquid water, like fresh water that is stored in them. And they're responding very uh, strongly to the climate change. And for example, if just the Greenland ice sheets melt, uh, the sea level is going to rise about uh, 7.4 meter. And I'm focusing and working on the Greenland, so I'm going to keep the ice cream and uh, Antarctica for you guys to figure out. <laughs> so um, 
Imagine the thickness of the Greenland ice is about three kilometer. And from that three kilometer, the annual accumulation is about 90 centimeter. And then we have fern, which is a transition between the snow to ice, which is like more compacted snow, sorry, the transition between the snow to ice, which is like more compacted to snow and it's got more density. And, uh, and it has the potential to keep the water in a liquid form in itself. And what I'm trying to understand is that when the melting season starts, how this meltwater percolate through the system and how what is this processes and how deep it's gonna like uh, penetrate and where it's gonna refreeze this or stay in a liquid form and what's gonna happen to it. Well, I'm part of the Fern Cover Project, which is a NASA funded project by uh, University of Colorado. And every year, there are like five people go with a C-130, one of those big giant cool flight to Kangaroo Swag, uh, which is some town over here. And then we uh, go to the five, six stations on the Southern Greenland. And we traverse uh, between east, each, each uh, site with the uh, uh, skidos and we camp there and we do our measurements and then we traverse again for a couple of hours and do another measurements and move uh, for a month on the ice sheet. And this is actually a very cool picture that NASA took uh, from our camp in May, uh, yeah, this May. And up there actually, I was up there trying to wave, but I don't know if it's... <laughs> uh, So uh, my first, first uh, field season was in 2016, and uh, we dug uh, about five meter into the ice and the snow uh, to set up our measurement, and it took us a long time, and every night we had to cover it up to, so it doesn't fill up to like, be able to do our measurements. And the method that I used for measuring the water content uh, is that uh, it's called TDR, which is stands for Time Domain Reflectometry, which is this sensor here. And how it works is that this, uh, that's, that's a battery up there and the data logger, and this is the TDR sensor. And this sensor sends EM waves, electromagnetic waves, to these wires and there's a, to these probes that, uh, uh, it's about like 30 centimeter rods that I stick into the snow and fern layers between ice lenses. And uh, it measured the time that this EM waves go through the system to the to this wire to the end of the probe and back. And it measured the dielectric. And then we put it in the equation to measure the water content to get the volumetric water content. And I set them up in a depth of four meter, like eight sensors. And my point was to see, like between, to see this big ice lenses here to see like how the water moves through the system, if it re refreezes or uh, yeah, how deep it penetrates. And then right beside them, I set up, the, uh, I put the thermistors to measure the temperature of the snow. <coughs> and then about 500 meter away, I repeated the same measurement, but more shallower to look at the spatial variability and also to see these uh, processes in more details. Also, I set up a, a weather station uh, to measure the wind, pressure, temperature, uh, and uh, what is there, radiometer, and all of that to measure my, my melt. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, it's uh, programmed to uh, measure every 30 minutes collect the data, the data every 30 minutes. And this is how it looks after we set up everything. That's my federal station, and this is underneath this is that whole uh, pit that we saw, four meter deep. And down here, it's uh, uh, my colleagues, Achim Helik, uh, upward, looking uh, upward looking radar. Uh, and um, then back in 2017, uh, this is the field work. Like, this is what happened to your sensors. Uh, you have to dig out everything with like, uh, 
under the lots of snow and we have to dig everything out and lots of things are broken, we have to fix it and uh, yeah, and set everything up again nicely for measuring for another year. Other things that I do, it's uh, ice scoring. So uh, it, in each location that I showed you in the map, in five different locations, we go and we uh, dig about, like drill 20 to 30 meter deep ice cores. And uh, uh, we bring them up and set them on the snow and we look at the ice lenses and we measure where the breaks and then we cut them every uh, 50 centimeter and we measure the density and uh, then we bag them and then I brought, bring them back in the research station in the kangaroo swag and then I melt them and then I bottle them and then bring them back to the University of Calgary and then I measure the uh, uh, take them for the isotope analyze to see if I can see the depth of the melt water retention through the isotope signals. And uh, this is one of my uh, main research stations in Dye Tube that I have all my, uh, uh, like my TDRA, TDRB, the 2D TDR sensors and the weather station, all my setup are there. And the EKT was another place that I was um, uh, doing the ice score. And this is my preliminary results. Well, this is from the, April, yeah, April 2016 till September data. And it, the top one shows the, the blue lines, shows the air temperature. And the bottom one, which all these nice colors, are the different uh, sensors that I showed you in different depth that shows the, like, that measure the temperature of the snow. And the bottom one is the dielectric. So, uh, that's what I calculate, that, uh, what the data that I get from my TDR sensors. Then I do the uh, uh, water content measurements to them. And you can see like when the melt season starts, how it affects the temperature and the, and the dielectric in the different depths. And when I zoom a little bit more and, uh, to the dielectric and the temperature to show how it's sh show the melt water is that uh, when the temperature rises in the snow layers, it's uh, actually uh, decreased the dielectric, and that's how we know that the, how deep that the uh, melt water penetrated. This, is, this color shows the different depths of my uh, uh, sensors, and shows like that when it goes to the zero, the dielectric increases, and that's how we see the water content. And we don't see that in a uh, two bottom sensors that I have because the water didn't reach there. Well, there's lots of data that I'm collecting still, and but for now we uh, measure that the depth of the meltwater percolation was about two meter, and um, it didn't it passed the ice lenses, but if it reaches it reaches to zero degree, pretty much. Um, here I want to show you one of our nice work days. I was in 2016, I was transmitting my data through satellite transmission, but uh, then one day I was wearing a big gloves and I broke the whole uh, back of my, uh, what do you call it, uh, where you put your SIM card and I couldn't fix it. So this year I'm not collecting it online, yeah. So I can't see what's happening for 2017 to compare that. The way to go back to my field uh, work and yeah, to collect the data. Did she ever complain to you about stuff? <laughs> 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 uh, he shouldn't. <laughs> why? No, not yet. He hasn't? No. He, he needs to teach you about his 30 centimeter snow pants. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, just cut like five meters. <laughs> oh, how dangerous they are. Yeah, so we have one last uh, yeah. talk. So our last speaker, repeat offender. Sarah is Sarah St. Germain um, from Geography, and she's going to talk today. 
Where is yours? Right. Oh, there it is. Okay. About the evolution of superglacial streams, and we're glad to have you back. Okay, so I'm Sarah, and today I'm going to be talking about the evolution of superglacial streams. Uh, so superglacial streams are channels that exist on the surface of a glacier during the summer season, and they are a significant part of glacial hydrology and glacier dynamics. This is because as a stream flows on the surface of the glacier, it can create a moulin, or a hole, which uh, allows water to travel through the center of the glacier and can reach the glacier bed. If water reach, reaches the glacier bed, it can accelerate the flow of the glacier and cause increased melt. This has large impacts on sea level rise. Uh, so a little bit of important background information. Superglacial streams form where the stream bed erosion is greater than the adjacent glacier ablation or the melt. So what happens is the water erodes the glacier faster than the sun is melting down on the glacier. And this causes incision to occur and the stream becomes deeper into the glacier. Uh, so there have been a few fundamental studies done on superglacial streams, however many of them are decades old. A few recent exceptions include studies done on the Greenland ice sheet, but most of them are using remote sensing and mapping stream location or stream number. Uh, so to date, superglacial streams have not been fully described within the literature, and the formation and evolution processes remain understudied. Uh, so as it was mentioned, uh, my st I, this is, a, I think, my third year um, presenting, and I've been to my study site, which is on Violet Island, uh, four times now. I did my master's here too, that's why. Um, so my study site is on Violet Island, which is in Nunavut in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. So from Calgary, we fly to Ottawa, Ottawa to Iqaluit, and Iqaluit to a small community called Pond Inlet. And from Pond Inlet, we helicopter across to Violet Island. Violet Island is part of Sir Millic National Park and approximately 45% of the island is covered by glaciers. My study is on a small Arctic glacier called Fountain Glacier, and I'm specifically studying uh, three streams on the surface of Fountain Glacier. Uh, the first one is a central stream, which is here, and it is a very small stream, and it's a surface stream, so it's not deeply incised into the glacier. Then the next one is the northern stream. So here, uh, upstream, it's a surface stream. And then as you travel uh, downstream, it becomes incised into the glacier. And then the third one is a large, deeply incised canyon. So my research aim is to determine the evolution and processes that form superglacial streams and canyons. And each year, my objective has been to create an orthophoto and a digital elevation model. And then I'm now comparing and contrasting the superglacial streams on the surface of Fountain Glacier in order to determine the factors that influence the evolution. Um, so in order to do this, uh, we place uh, targets, which are about this big, and they're yellow and they're plastic, on the surface, and we hammer them in. And then I use a high precision GPS to take the coordinates of the targets. And then I use a UAV, so an unmanned aerial vehicle or a drone, and attach a camera to the bottom of it and fly the drone over the study site. And then when I return from the field, I use a program called PhotoScan, and I load in all of the millions of pictures I've taken and the coordinates to the targets, and then I'm able to create an orthophoto of the entire study area. And then this is the DEM. 
Uh, so my results, I'm going to show you images from all three streams over a number of years. Um, so some background information on the central stream. It's 0.5 meters wide and 0.35 meters deep. It has a very low discharge and it has a very low sinuosity and a low slope. Uh, so in this image, you can see the 2010 stream is in this location. Then the 2016 stream has changed to be on top and completely switched in 2017 to be on the bottom. And then you can see here that it's an, it's an extremely straight stream here and lower down closer to the end, uh, it's more of a meandering stream. Uh, then the northern stream, uh, it's uh, about 1.5 meters wide and 2 meters deep. Uh, it has a medium uh, discharge in comparison to the others. It has a medium sinuosity and a high slope. Uh, so in 2009, uh, this was the location. And you can see it's uh, extremely meandering and it was deeply incised into the glacier. However, in 2010, it decided to change location, and in 2011, it also changed location again. So in 2010 and 2011, it was a surface stream, so it wasn't deeply incised. And then in this location here, in 2017, it remained in the same position, but incised, incised deeper into the glacier and became more meandering. And then the canyon is 25 meters deep and 90 meters wide. It has an extremely high discharge and a high sinuosity and an average slope. You can see that unlike the other ones, this one doesn't change location as much. However, there are cutoffs uh, in the stream where the meanders have uh, gone straight instead of continuing to bend. So for the discussion, I'm going to discuss why each of these streams is the way it is. Uh, so for the so small central stream, um, you can see here that this is in 2015 where it was a um, meandering channel that's now been abandoned. And this is because the stream has cut through a crevasse and all of the water is running through a crevasse. And then a year later, um, the stream has started to meander again. So it's no longer straight in the crevasse. Uh, then for the northern stream, uh, you can see here the channel actually filled with snow during the winter. And this caused a uh, diversion in 2010. Um, so the stream completely diverted because it couldn't go through its original channel. And it became a straight, uh, no longer incised stream. And you can see, uh, this is another image, where in 2010 it was a surface stream and not meandering. And here you can see that the canyon is widening some um, because of the meanders and how they're forming. So the meanders cause a canyon-like um, valley to form. And then for the canyon, it has a completely different um, factor that influences it. So you can see in the top image, one of the walls of the canyon is at 90 degrees. However, the south facing wall is actually at 30 degrees. And this is because solar radiation is actually enhancing the size of the canyon. And because the stream is actually located within a canyon, it can't divert like the other streams. However, um, the meanders do grow and cutoffs occur. And one of the reasons cutoffs occur is because, again, because of snow blockages, uh, if the channel is filled with snow, it diverts to a different location. Um, so overall stream comparisons, uh, the small streams are impacted by crevasses on the surface because they are not deeply incised and can change location frequently. 
Uh, the medium-sized northern streams are incised uh, if they remain in the same location, but if the channel gets filled with snow during the winter, the entire stream may divert. And then the large canyons are influenced by solar radiation and are deeply incised, so the channels are uh, not able to divert, but the meanders grow and cutoffs occur. Uh, so in terms of my scientific uh, contributions, I'm giving insight into the dynamic channel adjustment and processes controlling channel evolution in a range of channel sizes. And this has overall scientific importance because glacial hydrology is important for glacial dynamics, uh, particularly in Greenland where climate warming is occurring and streams are growing and incising, causing conduit formation through the center of the glacier, again lubricating the glacier bed, increasing glacier flow, and increasing melt rates, and causing higher than expected sea level rise. Uh, lastly, I'd like to give special thanks to all of the funding agencies, my supervisor, Brian Mormon, and all of my field assistants. Questions? With a normal, well-behaved uh, terrestrial river, uh, you get the meanders because the, there's erosion on the outside bank and deposition on the inside bank. But with a glacier, I guess here you get the erosion. How would you just? There is no deposition. Um, which means some of the meanders look different. However, they still can form an S. It's just by erosion, though. There's no deposition. Great answer. Thank you. So you can. I'd like to thank all of the students, the speakers today. It's great to see such a broad range of research going on, and I think it's just. Uh, bad pun coming, the tip of the iceberg with respect to the kind of work that the students are doing here at the university across all kinds of different departments, many of which are not represented here. So um, thanks again to everybody. And I have just a few words that I wanted to say about the Northern Scientific Training Program. The program sitting now under the new Polar Agency, Polar Knowledge Canada, and there's um, opportunity for students who've benefited from that program and faculty whose research has been supported through their students to provide information to NSTP through the Polar Knowledge Board about the value of that program and ways that it might be Im improved and um, uh, leveraged for other kinds of things. And if you're interested in knowing more about that, I would encourage you to come and see me. Thank you. And thanks to everyone else.